Good afternoon. I'm Adam Weinberg, the Alice Pratt Brown Director of the Whitney Museum, and I wanted to welcome you to this conversation today. I am the introducer to the introducer who will introduce the introducer, um, which means I'm supposed to speak very, very briefly. Um, uh, the unintentional themes of today, actually, are sort of collaboration, conversation, and dialogue. And we are honored to present this conversation today um, between Angedeka Akunili Crosby and Siddhartha Mitter, Mitter on the occasion of Angedeka's newly published book, The Beautiful Ones, which I have brought my copy here to show you. They're available outside. It is a, be a beautiful book, which is the title of the, of the show, and I hope you have a chance to at least look at it. Njedeka's work is in and of itself about dialogues, dialogues between Nigerian and American cultures, the European portraiture tradition and African portraiture between painting and photography and mixed media. The Whitney got to know Njedeka through her magnificent and magisterial 2015 commission that she did for the billboard on Gansevoort Street, which is called Mama, Mummy, Mama, based on a painting of the same name, which is also in the book itself, which addresses intergenerational conversation among her sister, her mother, and grandmother. Today's program is in collaboration with Thelma Golden and the Studio Museum in Harlem. Thelma is a dear friend who is a director, curator, who spent many years working here at the Whitney. In fact, I think she worked here for so long, people still think that she's working here full time. Um, it is really her first home, her second home, and her first home yet again. And we're always happy to welcome her back. And, I think, as many of you know, the Studio Museum is in the process of um, uh, planning for and then building its magnificent new David Atche building uptown, which we are all so excited to see. So we are thrilled to be working on this program jointly today, which is something that Thelma um, offered to put together with us. We're thrilled to have Njedeka here today. Welcome back. And um, I just wanted to mention, for those of you who did not see Artnet yesterday, there was a beautiful tribute to the Studio Museum and its prestigious residency program, which is now in its 51st year with over 100 artists. And it reading this piece, which is a short tribute, it's really amazing at how much and how the Studio Museum has changed the face of American art today. And um, happily, we can say Njedeka was one of the residents in that program. So thank you all for being here today. May I introduce Thelma Golden. Thank you, Adam. Good afternoon, everyone. It is so amazing to be here at the Whitney, which very much um, feels like home. I want to thank Adam and the entire Whitney team for offering to co-host this event. Um, especially want to thank Megan Huer and her entire incredible team here in public programs that have made this happen, and also to the Studio Museum and Harlem team. I also want to express deep thanks to everyone at Victoria Mural Gallery who helped make this program possible and made this monograph possible as well. I am really excited to introduce um, Njedeka and Siddhartha on the occasion of this talk and of this gorgeous, beautiful volume. Um, as was said, this book is the second publication on the now Los Angeles-based artist and considers her acclaimed ongoing series, The Beautiful Ones. It features extensive illustration of works in the series and other photographs and a really amazing essay by Siddhartha Mitter, who reflects upon the work's complex history as well as the social, cultural, and personal themes throughout. And Jadeka was born in Nigeria in 1983, where she lived until her teenage years before moving to the United States. She studied art and biology at Swarthmore College before continuing at the Pennsylvania Academy of Fine Arts and Yale University School of Art, where she received her MFA. She then, soon after, was an artist in resident, as was said at the Studio Museum in Harlem. And since then, she has had many incredible career accomplishments, including several exhibitions in museums around the world, the amazing commission here at the Whitney and others, a solo exhibition at the Hammer Museum in 2015, and participating in the 50th, 58th Venice Biennale, May You Live in Interesting Times. She currently lives and works in Los Angeles. 
Siddhartha is a freelance journalist based in New York who focuses on the social, cultural, and political context of the arts. He currently writes for a number of publications, including the New York Times, Art Forum, Art in America. Previously, he made incredible contributions to The Village Voice and also has written for The Guardian, The Boston Globe, and served as a cultural reporter for, at WNYC Public Radio. He is currently working on projects in New York City, Mississippi, several African cities, and as he just told me earlier, Detroit. I am thrilled to be here because this volume really represents an opportunity to spend more time in the incredible world that Angie Decca has created. Through her work, she has taught us all so much about how to look and about learning about what we see. Her work, as Siddharth refers to it, is a memory project, but it's also a project of exploration that so much of what we understand comes through the deep layers, both the physical layers you create in the work, but also the layers of the mind and the heart that you explore. So it is with that I would like to say, um, it is my pleasure to introduce Siddhartha and Njadeka. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, thank you, Thelma. Thank you, Adam. And uh, thank you all for being here. Good afternoon. And uh, thank you, Njadeka, for entrusting me with the privilege of thinking with you and looking deeply at your work and spending time with it. Uh, we have a rotation. The rotation has begun, right? Yes. Of, um, of, the works, of the works in the series. And what I propose that we do is that we jump right on into the work. I know that people will have interest in this series and they will also probably have interest in other things that Njideka has been working on. And uh, I propose that we go straight into this work and we can then find our way out from the details on out. Um, I wanted to ask you, uh, a lot of your work uses methods, techniques, and so on that these works have in the beautiful ones. So what is it that distinguishes these? What makes them a series? What do they have in common that makes them different from your other works? Um, thanks for the question and I'm so excited to be here with you. And before I answer that question, I wanted to thank everybody for coming out this afternoon for this conversation. I really appreciate it and it just makes me so thankful and grateful to see you all here. I would like to thank the Whitney um, for hosting this, the Studio Museum, um, Victoria Miro. Um, thank you, Thelma, for that beautiful introduction. Um, thank you, Adam Weinberg, for the introduction of the introduction. <laughs> and I also want to thank Megan, Steph, Sophia, and if, if I didn't mention your name personally, I'm sorry, but all the people behind the scene who worked tirelessly for weeks to make this happen. I'm really grateful to the sound check people, everyone, people who set up the seats. Um, so um, this, this series, The Beautiful Ones, it differs from the rest of what I've done because these are the, I mean, I can honestly say the only works I've done that are straight portraits. And I think these are also the only works I've done where the people are looking right at the viewer. Mm -hmm. I tend to, create scenes where you're not, the viewer is not acknowledged, it's just people going on living their lives and you just happen to have the privilege of getting a, a glimpse into this world. Um, but with this series, it will, I think these are the, the works I have that are the closest aligned to the kind of photographs, studio photographs, my siblings and I would have taken growing up um, because People didn't have a lot of disposable cameras, or just households didn't have cameras. So you took pictures during special events, you went to the photographer's studio in your Sunday best, and then you had to do your pose um, because you were very proud of your new outfits. Um, so I remember a lot of pictures we had from like when I was born up until the late 90s where that format and I really wanted to do a series. Well, it didn't start off wanting to be a series. I wanted to do a piece that tapped into that. So thinking of photographs like Malik Sidibe's photographs, but also thinking of 
um, portrait paintings, like Velasquez's painting of Prince Balthasar Carlos and wanting to do something that spoke to both. And the presence here is particularly a presence of children. Yes. Yeah, because I think, so we did being children, it started with, I wanted to do portraits because it was something I had shied away from. You know, every artist has their weird battles they have with themselves when they're alone in their studio. And mine was with portraits. They terrified me, they still do. And <laughs> I think I've said this in enough places that it's not a secret anymore, but I will let you in on a secret. That's why I have my people lots of times looking away <laughs> in addition to other things. Um, but I, I can get very obsessive and uh, I can just like, you know, just work something till it loses that, you know, that quick energy you get when painting is flowing. And I felt whenever I did portraits, I went to that space of overthinking. And so I, I've, um, for years, I've always, I still do it, trying to find ways to pull myself out of that space um, so that the painting is loose, exciting, I'm interested in what I'm doing. And so I felt like I had gone years where I hadn't really done any portraits. And then I realized I was operating from a space of fear. And I decided to dive headlock in, head, head straight into it and confront this thing I was scared of and do portraits. And so when I decided to do it, I thought, okay, how do I get this started? I should look at someone whose portraits I like. So I started looking at Velasquez and I really liked one of his portraits of the little princes and it was a kid. And then I remembered those photographs we had taken as kids and that's how I started working with children. So, so you worked your way kind of backwards into it, into the family archive because mm -hmm. there was a there was a purpose you wanted to achieve from it. Yes. And so at what point did you then realize that you were actually like, hmm, I'm, I'm making a series here. There's going to be more of these. Um, after the second one. So the first one, it'll cycle to it at some point. It's of my oldest sister. It's a little girl wearing glasses. And she's wearing this weird jumpsuit, which we call tumbo. She's wearing her tumbo and she's posing and looking at you with her arms out. So that was the first one I did, and that's the one that closely resembles Velasquez's painting of Prince Balthasar Carlos. And I thought it was a one-off, because that was like my, I'm going to try this out. Maybe a portrait painting is not that scary. And, and you did a few and versions, right? I did a yeah. few versions. I did the first one, and it did a lot of the things, and I could go into this later, but a lot of the things that made me kind of shy away from portraiture and I felt like I didn't quite get the color right so I decided to try it again. So I did the, the version you will see in the rotation. So I did that one first and I really enjoyed it and it was a very different tempo in terms of constructing the space. Because if you've seen other things I, I do, they tend to ha be bigger and have more complex architecture and objects in the space and these um, just slowed things down a bit. I really enjoyed doing it. And so after I finished the one of my sister, I went back to doing big multi-figure pieces. And what the beautiful ones became for me, this is the second one, um, what they became for me was a way to pause or exhale in the studio. So after I made a diptych or triptych or something that was very complex, I liked going back to these beautiful ones. They helped me kind of breathe and calm down. They were complex to figure out, but they didn't take as much time. So this is the first one. And now if we could see the one of yeah. my That's brother in green. And it's hard to tell, but if you see them next to each other, you can tell they were conceived next to each other. The, the compositional lines mirror each other. And so it was just meant to be a bracket, one and two. Um, but I really enjoyed two of them. And every time I felt slightly exhausted from dealing with a complex composition, but you know, there's that anxiety you always have as an artist if you're not working. And so I wanted to do something yeah. a little bit like ease my way back into a big piece. This was what I did. So it's a little bit of a home, a little bit of a, a safe space as yeah, it were. Yeah. And I've, yeah. 
have really enjoyed doing them over the years. And it's one of the things that looks simple, but they are not, they're, they're very, yeah, it's one of the things I always think of them as uh, my breather, but they end up <laughs> taking just as much time to compose because what happens in, in these pieces is that the figure takes up most of the space. So I don't have much space around it and I'm trying to cram narrative mm -hmm. into the piece with very little room. So it's just like, what is that little one thing I can add to it that says a lot, but it's usually just one thing that I can accommodate and how do I bring that one thing into this limited composition. So I want to get in a, in a few minutes, maybe we can get into that in a little bit more detail, but Andy, can you bring us to the one that is not part of the pattern, the one that I had first uh, flagged to you? Um, it's, as you probably saw in the rotation, there's one piece that is um, that breaks the format that we're talking about. It's the one where the figure, it's a self-portrait, um, no, 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 the, the precursor, the precursor. No, no, we're, 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 we're having a, yeah. oh, th this one. Yeah, can you, can you hold on that one? So this one here uh, is, uh, it breaks from the pattern. It's a self-portrait. Uh, you're looking away, as you were saying. You were not facing <laughs> and, and, and doing yourself. Um, but the reason I bring it up is that this is, uh, this becomes a precursor to the series because it is called uh, The Beautiful Ones Are Not Yet Born Might Not Hold True for Much Longer. And it's from 2013. Uh, and it gives us an opportunity to get into the title. But I want to first ask you, um, what's the energy of this piece? It feels, is it wistful and contemplative? Um, actually, and I have actually a, a, a practical question I wanted to ask you. Where is it? The colors are very Nigerian, but the radiator is, is uh, suggests cold, suggests a cold climate. I love that you noticed yeah. the no, color. No, no, I've been wondering about that for a while. I meant to ask you about it. Yeah, so I, I like that there are things in my work that maybe not everybody gets, but I love when I meet Nigerians or people who are familiar with Nigeria and they zero in on it. And lots of times with the colors, I'm thinking a lot of interior colors you see in Nigeria. And it's one of the things I'm curious if if anybody knows the reason why, but it just seems so many interiors in Nigeria have like this bluish mm -hmm. wall. The one at the top there, Or it's yeah. like a mint blue, or there's a very, there's another type of darker blue that just seems like 70% of interiors of houses built at a certain time. Yeah have that wall paint, you know, just like, does someone just ship 10 containers of this paint to yes. us and everybody is using it? Right, there's a certain um, green also that yeah, pops up that's not green. necessarily the most appetizing <laughs> green, but it pops up in a lot of, um, so, so while um, they, while they, while yeah. they bring us back to, and then sometimes um, we, we do go, the, yeah. I don't know if you've noticed, um, and for those who don't know, Siddhartha goes to Nigeria a lot. I, I don't think I've ever mentioned the Nigerian to you that you didn't already know. It's a bad habit. Yeah. <laughs> so, but I don't know if you've ever noticed the two-tone stuff they do yes. inside houses, where there's like a line about this high mm -hmm. and there's a different color. Always, yeah. And one is shiny. And I think it's just because people touch walls a lot. So the bottom half is a little bit shiny so you can wipe off the grime. So with the colors for this, I was trying to tap into that. So if you were familiar with that space, the wall will remind you of that. The floor, um, I was thinking of colors you see a lot in Enugu in eastern Nigeria. Mm -hmm. the, the earth is very red, and there's just this layer of pinky peach dirt that settles on everything. I, I, I love it. When I was young, I wanted to eat it. <laughs> and I was telling my husband I used to wipe windows and lick it <laughs> because it's just like it's in the air and you, you smell it all the time and when it's about to rain. Um, so I was trying to almost like how do I capture a memory, a feeling of a place in color? Um, but also in terms of where is this, one of the things I play with in my work is really putting creating this space that isn't really anywhere. And that ties into the life I've lived. I grew up in a little town in Eastern Nigeria. I went to high school in Lagos, which is the big cosmopolitan city. 
I moved to the United States in my late teenage years and I've been here since. So I've kind of lived in all those places and the person I am is a collection of all those experiences and spaces I've existed in. So creating this thing that is a mix of everything. So you have a radiator that speaks to, I think at this point we were living in Brooklyn? Yeah, Sunset Park, that speaks to that apartment we had, but then you have the kerosene lamb that speaks to village. Um, that's a picture, the kerosene was taken of my grandmother's table in the village because electricity wasn't constant. And then I'm wearing this dress by Boxing Kitten, which is, I don't know if they are still making clothes, but at the time I bought it, it was a Brooklyn-based designer, but was using Vlisco, which also comes with Wax its own fabric, history. Yeah. It's like African fabric, but it's produced in Holland. Um, so that's a boxing kitten dress, but then I have this hairstyle that is very like traditional rural hairstyle. Um, so it's like a mix of all those things. And, it, and it, it echoes also the way that you have slippages of surfaces uh, in a work mm -hmm. that um, the image transfers aren't necessarily on a single plane. Something moves onto the figure, moves off. There's some weird geometries that 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 feel right, and then you look at them closely, and 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 they're a little bit ambiguous. Um, but what's interesting to me about this series is that it's it's a set of works in which uh, you're not doing the cross-cultural encounter. You're really you're really you're really in Nigeria, and I want I want to circle back for a second back back to the question of the title. Um, because uh, this is one of those things that people who've read the book know all about it and people who don't. But in 1968, the Ghanaian novelist uh, Aikwe Arma publishes a book called The Beautiful Ones Are Not Yet Born. And it's, uh, it's quite experimental, poetic, uh, morose. Um, I won't give away, it's, it's, it's a beautiful book and a, a classic and so I, I won't give away what, what happens in it, but the, the protagonist is just known as the man, and he is working his way through a society where things are um, decaying, and where corruption is growing, and where authority violence is around. And essentially, as he tries to continue to live a moral life, he ends up getting sucked into degradation no matter which way, no matter which way it happens. And um, it becomes a classic of African literature alongside, you know, Achebe and, and, um, and so on. And, and people read it. I mean, I, I think that as a person who was sort of interested in Africa, I must have read it in like a college freshman class. You must have read it high in school. high school, right? In like the Heinemann African yeah. writer series with the orange, <laughs> with the orange thing. Uh, and so, that book, uh, he titles it The Beautiful Ones Are Not Yet Born, and it is an allusion to a time of decay, and it's, it's a depressed book, mm -hmm. right? But here you say The Beautiful Ones Are Not Yet Born uh, might not hold true for much longer. That's an optimistic. Yes, so. <laughs> the, is, is, this, is, this, is this a person who's having a hunch about the future? Yes, and so this is a perfect time to talk about um, the, the titles, and thanks for that great background to where the title came from. So The Beautiful Ones I Know You're Born is, it's like a version of, I don't know, what's the book every American reads, Catcher in the Rye or to something? To Kill a Mockingbird, yeah. yeah. exactly, <laughs> yeah. it's like everybody reads it. If you're in the literature class, you will read this book. And even if you've not read it, everybody like knows that sentence. And so the book was written in, in a time, it was based, based in Ghana, kind of talking about Ghana, Ghana's history, but it still overlaps with a lot of West African countries, which is that after the West, various West African countries became independent, it was this period of great hope because a lot of the countries had amazing rich natural resources like gold in Ghana, oil in Nigeria, and we had all felt like what held us down was um, the British. So once they left, it will be this paradise and Nigeria will be the giant of Africa. I mean, I felt like I heard that my whole childhood. And so after Ghana and then Nigeria became independent, 
we had like very short moment of democracy and then it was military rule. Like my whole life from when I was born to when I left Nigeria, uh, Nigeria was just one coup and one military dictator, one after the other. Abacha died the year I left. Mm -hmm. So I barely like lived in Nigeria once we became a democracy. Um, so the book is set in this period of this very hopeful time that never came to be. Like the, the hope was never fulfilled. Um, um, there was just corruption everywhere. The money from all those resources vanished. And so with this work and with the beautiful ones, it's, it's like a hopeful series for me, really one, seeing this cultural renaissance that is happening in Nigeria right now. And um, so kind of touching up on that cultural renaissance, but also kind of hoping that maybe my parents' generation were not the beautiful ones, but maybe my generation will be it, fingers crossed. And so, so if we can actually leave it on that one. And so with this piece, um, all the transfers are, um, because sometimes the, the transfers for mm -hmm. certain pieces are specific and they imbue the work with maybe cultural or um, cultural significance or different things. So with this one, the choice I made with the transfers, the little pictures that are printed into it is to use all women and a lot of women I admired because there was a time in Nigeria where um, there was like a group of incredible women in power who were doing amazing things, including my mother, and, and she was. This is not a humble, this is not like a, an unnecessary brag. No, she, um, she, was, she was special. If you, in the essay, uh, we put in the quote that, Ch that Chimamanda uh, Adichie says about her. If you want, if you want validation, Chimamanda oh. says that your mother was. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, so I keep telling people, I met Chimamanda. Chimamanda came to a house in when, Enugu. When you were little, right? In, like, right when I finished Swarthmore. And she came to our house because she wanted to meet my mother because she admired my mom so much. Mm -hmm. um, so if, you, if you're able to go back to the one of the girls sitting on the floor, I can just point through who a few of the women are. Yeah, so it has my mom, it has Chimamanda, um, it has a number of Nollywood actresses, um, Omotola, it has Ngozi Okonjo Iwala, I believe is up in the top corner. Former Minister of Finance. Um, he has Asha, the musician. He has Neka, like right there wearing the hat. Another great musician. <laughs> yeah, he has the Nigerian runners that won um, bronze at the Olympics, the, the four by four team. Um, I think he has Mirionyali, he has Onye Konwenu, he has Genevieve. So it really became like a map of women I thought were leading and changing things in the country and just spectacular leaders at that point. So we can go back to the rotation? Yes. Yeah. So Thank you. <laughs> you, can, you can rotate us through. But there's another slippage here, which is that there's a generational slippage mm -hmm. because if the children are the future, if the children are the beautiful ones, some of the children that you're doing portraits of are children that you encountered just recently. Others are your siblings at a certain time, and then one is also your mother at an earlier time. So it started with this one, and it's my sister. So I was thinking of this coming of age and how a, lo a lot of people in my generation were doing incredible things in science, in tech, fashion, literature, everything. So I started the series thinking of my family and working with family albums. So it's there with my sister was the first one and then my brother was the second one, the, the like pose in the green outfit. Um, that was my brother and I think this was the third one. This is the fourth That's one. Fourth. Yeah. yeah. So I think we're in, I, I think we're in sequence. Yeah. <laughs> so we don't have a lot of pictures in my family. I had mentioned that photos were very special. It Should was we hold on this one birthday. for a second? Yes. Yeah, let's hold on this one, please. <laughs> um, but it was either a birthday or you had to have gone to a studio. So I ran out of pictures that we had in my family that I could work from. So I also I started taking my own pictures. So yeah, there is this kind of 
time thing that doesn't follow because it was my generation as kids. But then I got to the point where I didn't really have a lot of pictures to work from. So whenever I went to Nigeria, I kept an eye out for kids that are of the age range that fit the Beautiful Ones project. But I took pictures of them if they reminded me of myself or my siblings as kids. So they, they had to be that feeling of, they're not us, but I, it feels, it resonates with me. And so that's how other people start coming into the series. And with the last few ones I did, I actually opened it up to my friends in high school and mm -hmm. told them about the project and asked people to send me pictures, their family pictures from when they were kids. And I've worked on a few from those. And that's something that I always find endlessly interesting in your work is the way that you allow these things to slip, that you are, you're operating from you come in with some very clear principles of what kind of work you're going to do, and then you stay within the principle, and you also kind of like let it slide a little bit, mm -hmm. uh, um, which in a way that feels partly very intentional, the way like the, the, the planes change, the image transfers come onto the figure or the, or the clothing and so forth, and then partly also just the act of being in, in the process. And one thing that I wanted to ask you, this is about this series, but it's really about all of your works that involve th this kind of signature method with the image transfers, is it's, it's very researched, clearly. It's very intentional. It's clear that it's a multi-stage process that's very, uh, takes a lot of time, is very painstaking, has a lot of precision. Um, and I want to ask you, where in your process are the points where that are the most contingent, the most improvisational, the ones where you don't know what's going to happen and the work is kind of speaking back to you? Hmm. When I start transferring the pictures. So when I do the transfers, um, I have a drawing of the work and I do little black and white studies to find out where the transfers go. And I'm thinking of the shapes of the transfer and how it moves through the paper. And once I decide on where the transfers will go, I have a theme, or it can be a color theme, it can be a time theme, it can be a political theme for the transfers. And I print out hundreds of pictures and I line them up on the studio floor. But when I actually start doing the transfers in terms of what goes where, some things are very strict, like I might know I want this picture of Onyeka to go next to this picture, like sometimes I'll do a picture of Onyeka, I use that a lot, but it's her album cover from the 80s and I'll have it with a picture of how I took, um, she came from my mom's funeral and I got to meet her and have a chat with her, so I usually juxtapose the two, so there's like this time jump, if you know that it's Onyeka and you can recognize her. So there are things like that that I will stick to, but when I'm pulling things, it it's becomes intuitive a little bit, like um, which colors I feel lead in next to other colors, what piece goes next to some, something else. And sometimes it might be something like, this one picture ends with blue, so I want a landscape with clouds to continue that transfer. Mm -hmm. So that's where the most movement happens. And then there's also kind of the application of washes. There, there, there's levels of saturation. Yeah. And, and some of them really have kind of that, that, that worn nostalgic feel. Yeah. And then others are really very kind of sharp and precise. Yeah. And I also, you mentioned washes and where things change. I don't know if anybody here has done printmaking. Um, but printmaking is almost like, um, you've done, it's almost like you, you do things and you cross your fingers and you don't always know how. There's always like a, a little bit of, What's the word I'm looking for? Chance. That's what I was, that's what I was asking about, <laughs> exactly. Um, um, yeah. So my husband is here and he can attest to the number of times in my studio when I've done a wash and they're like, it's too dark. <laughs> um, because what I do with the washes is I tip them all off. So like the green from this wall into his outfit is all taped off in one shape. And then I mix a translucent color and I take a roller and I roll it all through. And I'm 
I can't really, because painting is all about relationships, but I can't see the relationship because everything else is taped off. And <laughs> it's one of those things I'm just like, why don't I ever learn? Because I'll do it and I'm always like, ah, oh, it's too light. I'll do a second wash. And I do a second wash and I think, oh, that looks good now. And every time, it's like clockwork, I take off the tape and I was like, oh too dark <laughs> and <laughs> but this is how the magic yeah. happens right? but it's one of yeah. those things like people never know but and that sometimes people ask me about certain works and I, I just keep quiet <laughs> because otherwise I'll be like oh no that didn't work out and I know the things that didn't work out and other people never know it and lots of times the things that don't work out have to do with not quite hitting the wash the way I wanted it mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What about the role of uh, memorabilia? There are objects in these works, and um, it's interesting the, the, the way that memorabilia operate mm -hmm. because uh, the interiors are full of memorabilia, mm -hmm. and then at a certain point, the interior itself, the space in which they were, becomes memorabilia uh, through photography or just through, through memory. Uh, is this nostalgic work? No. No? But, you're, but you are nonetheless drawing on, like you could talk about that doll, for example, or the old radios and so on. Yeah, so with the, the things I'm um, picking up, you know, I was saying there's not a lot you can put in the space. We can stay on this for, li for the girl with the doll, please. Um, so it's like finding those little things to put in the work that say a lot. And so with the, sorry, I'm... Just oh, yeah. drew a blank. I'm, Memorabilia. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm trying yeah. to catch the train of thought that has whoop, gone away from me. Um, <laughs> I told you this might happen. Um, <laughs> no, the um, one second, one second. the girl and the doll. Uh, like, what is the doll? I totally had a full train of thought. Okay. I know what I wanted to say. Uh. Yeah, well, I've been thinking of, so for a long time in, in grad school, when even a grad school up until a year or two after grad school, I could tell that I wasn't really given backgrounds as much attention as I could or knew I, 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 I just, the backgrounds never rose to the, the, the attention I give to the figures and their hair and what they wore and what they were doing. And lots of times with the backgrounds, I kind of just shoved things here and there or did flat colors. So what I actually did for a few years is that I stopped, I made myself do pieces that didn't have people in it. So I could just focus on space and think of how space could be a portrait of a place, a portrait of a time, a portrait of, you know, like you can you can see a picture of uh, from an interior in Nigeria and know like this was um, like a civil servants. Yeah, a, what, what, uh, yeah, kind, of civil, yeah, what or, kind of family it was. Yeah, what kind of family it was. So really trying to plug into that and what are those objects that that make you think of that. So that's what I've I've been developing that a lot in the work and then finally going back to the people and trying to put people in these spaces that are now more complex. And sorry if that doesn't, if I'm not answering the question you asked, you can ask it again because that thought has gone. And so with this, this piece, this is my sister, my second sister during her, it was either her first Holy Communion or her confirmation, I don't remember which one, but I've always, so with the beautiful ones, there are certain images, I, once I knew it was a series, there are certain things I knew I, I had to do. So like the school, the girl in the school uniform, because just half your childhood is spent in a uniform. Another one is these white dresses. I don't know if I'm in this picture. I, I probably shouldn't point it out even if I'm in it. Um, but I d in some of these, there's a picture of me during my first Holy Communion and I'm wearing this poofy outfit with white outfit with pink ribbons. I hated it. Um, but everybody thought it was pretty, so I had to wear it. <laughs> um, so I always remembered the white outfit because my family was very Catholic and we had block rosary at my house and there were always there was always somebody doing First Holy Communion or confirmation. And so this is one of those images I think of that a lot of Catholic families will be familiar with. So I did this image of my sister, but I just felt like 
there wasn't specificity to it. It really could be anywhere. It could be in a country in Central America or East Africa. So I was thinking of how to... The the, the source photograph of... That, that, that you took it from is actually in, in yes, the book. Yes, it yeah. was my, yeah. And so I was thinking of how to make it have specificity. So I was, went back to my family album and I was looking at the spaces in the pictures. And there was this picture of a few of us in front of my grandfather's house in the village. And there was a bench and it had this windows. The house had windows similar to the one in this picture. So I decided to put the bench in it because we're always sitting out on the bench at night in front of the house. But it still didn't feel like it named where it was. And I decided to put the window, which for me is actually very specific. You see those windows if you go to houses in eastern Nigeria, Mm -hmm. because there are still those very old um, colonial-style houses. But even though it had specificity for me, it didn't really feel like it would translate. So then I kept thinking of what else to add. And so I thought, okay, what will we have played with? At that age, we didn't have a lot of toys, but which toys would we have had? So I started thinking of this thing, and we just mm-hmm. called it Doll Baby. So I started thinking <laughs> of <laughs> so I started thinking of these doll babies that we all had, and, and of course, it, and it's one of those things I think of, and it's exciting. But there's always so this like, oh, how do you find the picture online? Doll Baby Nigeria, <laughs> you know, it's like, what Google search do you do? So you know it's going to be a few hours. Um, but finally, I, I, I found them and actually found websites that had histories about it and talked of, of these doll babies. And that actually became more exciting than I thought because it was one of those objects I felt really sat in this space I was excited about in terms of the history of it. Because when I thought of it and when I was still looking for it, some, some of you have heard these stories before. My friend Lizzie, and I'll, I'll get to this, sent me a picture of this, not this particular one, but you had seen it in a store in Brooklyn. And I'll... I'll Come back to why everything ends up in Brooklyn but, sooner yeah. or later. Yeah. <laughs> so we used to play with these when we were kids, and they were cheap. You could get them in the market for I don't know, like ten naira or something, which is maybe ten fifty cents. Um, but I haven't seen them in years. So when I started reading up about it, they are called clonet dolls, and I had assumed they were something that came to us from outside because it's of a Caucasian girl with chrysanthemums and a teddy bear, just not our lives. Um, So I thought maybe it was one of the many things, because Nigeria imports a lot, I thought it was one of the many things that was imported from outside the continent. But what was very fascinating for me to discover is that it's made in Ghana, designed and made in Ghana. And it was like a doll that was made as a, like, a more modern day play version of their traditional fertility aquaba dolls, which are made of wood. And so I really loved this this object that was like a contemporary remake of something traditional instead of wood. It's now made of plastic and it's made for consumption by West African children, but it's of a Caucasian girl holding chrysanthemums and a teddy bear. And then there is like another layer to the history of this object, which is that it's now very popular amongst interior designers in Europe. Um, So you actually can't find them anymore in African markets. Um, Because once I started working, using it in the work, I thought because I I have to find pictures online in the exact configuration I, I want, and it became too, time consuming to try and find pictures because these were from the 80s and 90s. The pictures online are very scarce. So my brother lives in Nigeria. I asked him to go to the market and buy some of these for me. And he called me and he was like, oh yeah, the people in the market were just like, we haven't seen those in years. And so apparently I guess they are just made now and shipped to Europe because they can sell it for more there than in African markets. So I actually ended up buying three of them and I bought it online from a store in Spain. 
<laughs> so I had told my friend Lizzie about this Clonet dolls and how fascinating the history was. And then like weeks later, she sent me a picture of a storefront that had them. She was like, I just saw this in Brooklyn. <laughs> No, you just have to dress one in Vlisco, and then you have yeah. all the ambiguities of <laughs> what gets produced for whom, where, by whom, oh, and all that. Yeah, and yeah. I was so excited I called the store. I'm sure she was like, oh my God, who is this person? Are you buying something or not? Because I was like, do you know the history of those dolls that you have? <laughs> and they're like, I don't care. I, I just have them. <laughs> but it's I was a, like, where did you buy it from? I'm curious. But it's, it's a different kind of encounter. You know, Adam, in his introduction, was talking about the exchanges and encounters that take place in your work, and I think I was referring to this also the beginning that, that many of your pieces are, they allude either to your return visit from abroad or for uh, or your returns with Justin uh, mm -hmm. from abroad. And, and those are extraordinary works, I think, that, that, that capture something relational in a way that I have never seen anybody else, anybody else do. Uh, these ones are kind of loosed from those concerns and they can really be more of a reverie about Nigeria and public history and and private history also. And so when you when you go into these archives, these slipping, ever slipping archives, the archive of images, the archives of family, the the, the images that are brought to you by by uh, your friends, um, and then you do pop up in Nigeria what once a year or so. Um, um, what what is your feeling of time? What is your what is your feeling of change? Um, you know, people people go. Expatriates from one country to another, they go home and they think about change. And then, of course, uh, in Africa, in Nigeria, it's all, oh, it doesn't change. Oh, you know, blah, blah, blah. Um, but what is your kind of private feeling of change when you are in that landscape with all these images in mind and with the stimuli around you? Yeah. I mean, I think something that drives my practice, a lot of what I'm thinking of in my studio, and this all might not get talked of a lot or might not always come across is I'm actually trying to chase something that is constantly changing. Um, I left Nigeria in 1999 and even though I visited once a year, I didn't spend significant time in Nigeria again till after um, undergrad in 2004. I was in Nigeria for a year 2004 to 2005. And the Nigeria I left in 99 was not the same as the Nigeria I came back to. Um, and you know, I think it was in Americana, Chimamanda has this joke about like the Nigerian that still says Shay. Um, Shay is like a slang that is you know, from the 90s and nobody says it anymore. I'm the Nigerian who still says Shay. <laughs> um, so it's like the country really is moving away from me. Things, um, you know, you, you, the slangs are always changing. And I'm the one who's always like, what does that mean? Like whisper it into my ear. <laughs> I don't want to <laughs> announce to people that I don't quite belong anymore. And so I think there is, there is a part of the work that comes from this, like f trying to, put my finger on something that is constantly morphing and changing. Every time I go back, I see the change, I say culturally. Um, and and I'm, I'm trying to put my finger on it, but I'm also becoming more of an outsider every year. And so it, there is something about my relationship to Nigeria that is becoming more about how I hang on and consume the culture or stay connected to the culture through the pictures I collect and take when I'm there. I don't know, this, it's, it's, it's complicated and it's not quite clear to me and these are things I, that keep me up in the studio and trying to, you know, work is static, trying to make this static thing out of something you're still processing and and trying to figure out. But with, with, with the beautiful ones and in some parts of the bigger pieces, I think there is also, there is a collective memory that people who grew up in Nigeria at a certain time have. And I think some of it, especially around pop culture, 
I think some of it had to do with the limits of the things we had available to us. So I lived in, like, you know, Victor. Um, if we have a mutual friend who was just in LA and we're talking about the televisions, um, we had at least in Eastern Nigeria and he lived not in Enugu, but near enough that he also got the same two stations. Mm -hmm. We had NTA, which is a national station, and we had ABS. And everybody in like this whole big chunk of Nigeria only watched those two stations, unless you were incredibly wealthy and could buy satellite television, very like 1%. Um, TV started at four, sometimes six, and went to 10. So we all watch TV at the same time. We all watch the same mm -hmm. shows. So it's not like here where you could watch multiple things. Or even like when I came to America, something that fascinated me was like genres in music. Where people like, oh, I like country. I like rock. I like this. We all listen to the same thing that was on <laughs> TV. There was there wasn't really like that much choice. You turn on the TV, and if they have, um, I don't know, like. Uh, thinking of someone who would have been a big star. Um, what's that? Vic Onyabo, if they had William mm -hmm. Onyabo, everybody listened to it. So some of it is trying to find, so knowing that there is that wealth of information, but it's like, how do you tap into it? To, um, where I feel like if you, if you can do it successfully, you can actually have this moment where you can, t people who share that experience can be taken back to that, even if it's for a second. And they, um, I, I think there is something beautiful and powerful in having this, you know, because yeah. growing up in Nigeria at that time, we always felt, uh, it feels like you're, you're inconsequential. You're from this, I mean, not for us, but in, the way we felt we're perceived. They're from, not just from this country that it seems the rest of the world didn't care about, from this little part within that country that wasn't Lagos or Abuja or one of the big cities. And I think there's something magical in seeing that little experience reflected back at you. When, when I was thinking about the essay, um, I was digging around to understand where Aikwe Arama had actually found the title uh, from, because it doesn't really appear in the book itself. And somewhere around later on, he tells an interviewer that he had been uh, in, you know, driving around Accra, Ghana, and he saw, you know how like minibuses always have like various yeah. statements on the back of them about God or about whatever. Always and, and hopeful. And, <laughs> you know, and, and, uh, and then he saw one and it said, the beautiful ones are not yet born. And he was just like, this, this, this is it. This is, a, this is a sign. And then apparently he enlisted his friends to go and look for it so that he could take a picture of it and so that it could be the cover of the, of the book. He never, he never saw it again. So there was that, that slippage right there. And then he then says he relates it to something Egyptological uh, that apparently another name for Osiris, uh, the Egyptian god, is the beautiful one. And so he makes this connection about, about an African notion of change. It's, you know, Egyptology and that kind of thing. An African notion of change based on beauty, goodness, a moral progression, as opposed to the Western notion of, 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 of confrontation. And I was just kind of thinking, even just today, I was thinking that the confrontation model in the West is also in a complete uh, crisis, right? Fake news and both sides of them and so on. And I think maybe the question of the beautiful ones uh, is as valid now here um, as as it is in that environment. And um, maybe that's also why we're looking to younger people here uh, as well. And and it brought home to me another way in which, you know, the hyper-specificity of this work, these times, these references, also kind of brings us to something general that we can all, that we can all recognize. Um, before, before we, we close, or before we move to questions, um, let's just, can we move to the two pieces of new work? Um, I knew you had new work in the Biennale. I went to Venice. I had no idea what the, what the new work was going to be. And then I see these beautiful monochromes um, that are very different formally from uh, your other pieces, uh, and at the same time, very Nigerian with very Nigerian titles. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think we have two of them in the rotation here. Maybe maybe you could just tell us a little bit about 
the direction and um, about this work? Yeah. Um, so I feel like with the some of the bigger pieces, I try to cram. Sometimes I feel maybe too many things in them. So sometimes I like to isolate little pieces and focus on that. It's almost like, let me take this one thing out and just deal with that one thing. So this is one, the, the monochrome pieces, they are new, <laughs> but it's not very different from things I've done before. I'm trying to think of an example, um, but it does, if you go back to the works I've done, and I'm, at this point I'm thinking of, say, some of the pieces shown here, but even the piece that the Studio Museum owns, mm -hmm. I've always been interested in, you know, you've mentioned slippage a, a lot of times, um, but one of my teachers from the Pennsylvania Academy always talked about passage and silhouettes, like where things are silhouetted against something and where things just like passage into other things. And mm -hmm. I, I really use that to construct my pieces and I love passages. I love, I, I think, for me, that love started with Chrysophilis blue paintings just the things that really show the magic of painting and this optical aspect of painting that is almost impossible to capture in a picture. You have to see them in real life where there are these subtle shifts that happen and if you see something from afar, everything flattens out, but if you come up close, things are very clear and where they should be. One of the first times I did it is, I have a dancing piece called I Refuse to Be Invisible, and the woman is looking out at you, and she's really dark in front of a very dark background, and you can only see her because of this light blue. It's actually not light blue, it's, it's a, I put iridescent in it, so it shines, but it's a dark blue highlight, so everything just passages into each other. And I might, I might talk a little bit about why that interest started. And so it's this kind of one of the tools I've worked with for years, but I realized I love it enough that I just want to make, I wanted to try pieces that just worked with that tool. And I love portraits, that fear is gone. <laughs> so I wanted to just Clearly do so, yeah. um, little portrait paintings that were monochromes, um, burgundies on burgundies, blues on blues lots of whites and grays on white. And the first, so now one last thing and I'll go to questions. With the, the first one I did, uh, I refused to be invisible. I had taken, I had taken a, a class where we read, um, we read, it was an African literature class and we read Heart of Darkness and then we read Chinua Achebe's response to Heart of Darkness. But there was this part in Heart of Darkness where you know, it's just such an irritating book. We're just like, why am I reading this? Uh, <laughs> um, but, you know, it's just like someone who doesn't see people as, he really didn't see the Africans as people. Like, that's really all it is. Um, but there was this part where there was, he was talking about, like, mounds of darkness, and then they moved, and, oh, my God, they're people. And uh, it was, <laughs> um, so I was just thinking of this, like, this, this refusing to see or, or this not seeing things that are clear in front of you and thinking of how I could play with that visually. So having um, these things where all the information was there, it was on you to just take time and look. And so that's where I, I, the first time I did this kind of passage figure into the background. And this one is called I Day Feel Like. I Day Feel Like. I was thinking of Two Face. I, yeah. I like music references yeah. <laughs> that Nigerians would get. I think uh, we've, we've gone on for, for a little while, and I know that there are questions in the room. I believe there are some roaming microphones. Can the. Okay, there's one, there's one on each side. So uh, who's got a question? And then uh, once we do recognize you for a question, please make sure to wait until the microphone reaches you. But let's, uh, let's open it up. All the way up at the top. Oh. Hi. Um, my question is, 
Uh, as an artist, do you have agency over the type of work that you produce and make for consumption? Like, is this naturally the style of work that you enjoy making, or is this the style of work that you recognize um, is consum consumable by a specific <laughs> audience? Um, no, thank you for asking that. Um, <laughs> I, I, I will, no, I will answer this. No, because I'm, for me, I mean, for you to make art that, if you don't have, if your work doesn't excite you when you're making it, it shows. The viewer can tell when they look at it. So I have to care about what I'm making. So I, there needs to be some, I need to feel it as opposed to, oh, what will people like? And when I started making this work in grad school, I didn't think anybody would care. And that wasn't why I was making it. And if my career wasn't where it was today, I would still be very engaged in my studio and making work I believed needed to be seen. I was making what I wanted to see. Um, because in grad school, I thought I'm making work about me and my, I mean, I knew the conversation was bigger, but Ultimately, the images were about me, my family, my husband. I don't know if any, why, somebody wants to have a picture of like Njideka in their house. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, so that, that was never <laughs> why I went into it. Um, yeah, but I mean, sorry, this, I've, I feel like I had a similar conversation with someone earlier, so I'm trying to keep the conversation separate in my head. I'm very hard on myself, as I'm sure most of the artists here, that sounds familiar. I think artists are like some of the hardest uh, in terms of being critical of what we do. And I have had shows that I did not go to the opening of because I did not like the work I did, you know, because the wash was too dark. <laughs> <laughs> but stuff like that where, and I've, 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 I've been in an idea I know myself, if, I'm, if I don't like a work and, I just, and I, I'm next to it, I just, oh, it just eats me up. It just bugs me and I can't enjoy the, the opening. I think of what I could have done better. Um, so that is what pushes me, not what will happen after the work leaves the studio. It's about making work that I'm engaged with when I'm in the studio, that I feel might not all have fully worked out, but something did, feeling like I learned something with each work I make, um, feeling like I let myself work, um, try something new. I don't know if, if that answers your question, but. Yeah. Next question, up top. Hi, I'm TJ, um, also an artist from Ghana, and your work is uh, amazing. I've referenced it a lot to my students, and incredible. Um, for the dolls, I call it, uh, we call it uh, Chobi oh. in, <laughs> yeah, in Ghana. So um, based on the tribe, you would just say Chobi in Roba or Chobi in Itache and different. But I just wanted to know, at what point at, in your work would you consider a piece done? like? Um, JT, TJ, TJ, thank you for coming in for the question. Um, so that actually became something very important for me in, in grad school, when is a work done? Because I overwork things, and I mentioned this earlier. Um, so, I consider a work done because you can always do more to it. When I feel that all that it's, is needed to get what I want across, because there are certain things you're trying to say with the work. And once I feel those, that information has, you know, maybe not successfully, but at least I've, has been hit on, then I stop. So I, I don't want it to become, once I feel like anything I add would just be for the sake of adding something, but it actually doesn't move the piece forward, then it's done. It's not, I'm not done. I, I could answer it better, but I'll, I'll leave it at that. Um, Please. Sorry, and I think what it is is 
I think of good paintings. I, you know, Kerry James Marshall is someone I just absolutely adore. It's about an economy of means. You know, it's like when you look at his work and see how he can reduce a complex form to a few strokes. You don't have to name everything. Sometimes you just need three strokes to let us know that is a glass vase. And that does it. You don't have to do like every single reflection. So for me, it's that economy of means. I think the best paintings really have that. How do you say a lot with, with an economy of means? And once I feel that thing has been said, I stop. Go ahead. Hi. <clears throat> I'm just wondering where in New York right now we can see some of your works in person, and also approximately the size that you're working in. Yeah, so um, thanks for the question. Um, the, the beautiful ones before the, now I have the portraits in Venice, which are about this big, 20 by 24. But before that, the beautiful ones were my small pieces. <laughs> and they're, what's 42? Three and a half or three, three quarter feet by maybe five feet. And on average, the size I work with the most is seven feet by seven feet. That's probably the size I've done the most. And the reason why they're big is it's not just size for the sake of size. I want people to have uh, like a cinematic experience when they're in front of it. It's thinking of this like far read, close up read. So when you are far, you take in the big image, but then when you come up close, there is a separate journey that happens across the surface. I do a lot, and Siddhartha talked about this a bit, I do a lot of shifts in surface. I play around with the things I mix into the surface, the way I put things down, whether they are rolled, whether they are painted, um, whether you know I mix crushed steel in it or not, so that there are these, or even sometimes I'll collage fabric into it, so they are, um, you know, tactile changes on the surface that really help you kind of take this journey across it in addition to changes in time and things in the photographs. And so that's why this kind of expansive size is important. Where you can see things in New York right now. Wait for the Studio Museum to reopen. No. Yeah. But when you do, it is going to <laughs> um, be worth it. Yeah, the Studio Museum has a piece that is traveling right now. Black Refraction, opening in a week. A piece that's in our traveling collection exhibition, Black Refractions, that opens next week in Kalamazoo, Michigan. Yeah. Um, so if you look at the Studio Museum's website, it'll, it's, it's going to a number of locations, and it will be there. I'm thinking of where things are. There are some four pieces, five pieces, and one, two, three, four, five. Five pieces and the portraits in Venice. Where else is there something? Washington, D.C. Washington, the Norton Museum might still have something up. Um, yeah, the Pennsylvania Academy has their piece up. Philadelphia. Um, but hopefully... You just have to in, take a road trip. <laughs> in, I'm just like, what year are we in? In 2021, there might be something in New York. Okay. <laughs> so, so don't, so don't move away from New York yet. Hang, hang tight. We have one more, one more. Hello, uh, my name is uh, Jason Wallace, and uh, thank you for your generosity of like what your studio, studio practice looks like. Um, one of the questions that I had to ask is the fact that, like, listening to you, like, um, trying to work through the concepts of of your work and then the fussiness of like getting things just right. It kind of hints to me like production and I just wanted you to talk about like what your production was like when you were just finding this body of work and now that there is more popularity around you, what is it like now? Um, production in terms of numbers? Yeah, how many pieces? Okay, okay, well, yeah, yeah, sure. Um, thanks for asking. Um, so my pro most productive year was my year at the Studio Museum in Harlem. <laughs> um, so 2011 to 2012, and um, I will be eternally grateful for that year. Um, I didn't have kids yet. <laughs> I was doing long distance, so my husband was in 
Baltimore. So I lived alone in Harlem, and all I did was go to the studio. The story I have for that is I went to, I lived in the studio museum so much. I, 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 I didn't sleep there, like, I, should, I, should I admit? Should I admit to this now? I slept over sometimes. <laughs> um, but I was there so often that I got a call from the gas people to find out if I was okay, which was kind of shocking, but also it feels good to know, like, if, you're, if something happens to you, they will check up on you. Um, but, you know, they called, I was like, what's going on? It was like, we've not had a reading in three months. And I was like, because I don't cook anymore. I just, but seriously, like, I wake up, I just went home to shower and sleep. I woke up, I went to the studio museum, I was there all day. I went home around 11, slept, did it again the next day. So that's like just working morning till night. And you know, work is not always painting. Lots of times I'm sitting down, staring at the work, <laughs> or like doing a lot of research online, trying to find pictures, looking at art books, whatever you want, like whatever helps you produce. And that year, I think I made maybe 10 pieces. Um, but right now I do about six, six things a year. Um, but I mean, something that has been important to me, and it also like, I know myself, I, 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 it, it's not good for my mental health to make things I'm not happy with. I really do, you know, it's one of those things I'm just like, it, 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 it really bugs me when I feel I didn't give something my all or push it as much as I, I could have. So it's not a situation I, I like to put myself in. And when I stay working with my gallery, you know, you have that first conversation where they ask you like, oh, what do you want from us? And what can we do for you? And one of the first things I made clear is like, you cannot pressure me to make more work. Like, I will not do it. And, and I've stuck by it. I, I don't, um, I, I, I never want to feel like a, a robot, you, you know, because eventually, like, it's, it's good to s that they sell and I can live off it, but that's not the reason why any of us stay making it. I want to make something where I feel like I, I surprised myself. I did something meaningful that mattered. So that has nothing to do with that other part of it. So I will never sacrifice that. And I mean, this also gets to a question um, my husband and I, talk of a lot, which is something one of my teachers from undergrad asked, which is what does success mean for you? And I keep thinking, for me, success is, um, you know, m m you have your community of artists and I want to make work that gets the respect of artists I admire. And um, one of my really good friends is like a painter I've grown with. His name is Doron Langberg. Um, we went to the Pennsylvania Academy together. We went to Yale together. He's one of the best painters I know. Um, we've really grown with each other. And so he's like one of the voices in my, in my head. Like if I feel I'm, I'm not pushing myself enough, I'm making something that isn't my best painting, you know, he's like, I can, maybe a lot of people will not know, but someone like Doran, who is a great painter, will know that I cut corners in this. So it's like, so for me, it's just like, no, I want to make things like Doran will be, be like, yeah, and <laughs> I mean, <laughs> we, we all need that, yeah. Yeah, it's funny, yeah. I don't know if anybody follows no, Roxanne either. Gay on, on Twitter, but she talks a lot about her nemesis, not that Doran is my nemesis, <laughs> but how your nemesis is like that person who, pushes you to, you know, be at your best. And it's not like a mean rivalry. It's like just not like, I, I want that person to not be like, what is she doing? What? But in a um, nice way. But in a nice way. Um, so that's what drives me when I'm in my studio. What will I put out there? And I wouldn't want to run away from the opening. And I'll be proud of what I've done. 
where it's, where it's to live by. So I, I think there will be there is the opportunity to continue the interaction because I think what's going to happen now is that the books are going to appear and Jideka is going to uh, sign your books if you would like that to happen and so you can continue the interaction that way. Um, so just I'm, give us five minutes to set up. Yes. Well, okay, well, yes, yes, <laughs> stay, stick around. Um, and I'm happy that you are working at a moderate uh, deliberate pace because to me the the work the artists the 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 work that excites me the most is where I just want to know I really want to know what this person's going to be doing in five years I really want to know what they're going to be doing in 10 years the really good stuff is like man what's she going to be doing in 25 30 or 50 years so I want to know what you're going to be doing for decades and decades and decades to come so go slow Go slow, we got time. Thank you for your work. Thank you for sharing so much detail uh, intimately with us. Thank and uh, thank you all for being here. Thank you all for coming.